Mr. Rogers, over to you, sir. Well, thank you, everyone. Samarin, thank you very much for having me. Uh, fellow masters and instructors, I, I really appreciate you inviting me here to do this talk. I've, ca I've called it my journey so far because it is a journey. I'm learning about this and I just want to share with you. Basically, the, the topics I want to cover is my own personal history with autism. I think it's important for you to know my personal background, where I've come from, and then the, the journey I've had with my students. But also, I want to make this lecture very relevant for you. I know we all have classes and we have students with autism and additional needs. And if I have any bit of information that can help you out at all, I, I want to share that with all of you. Just before I get started, I just want to say I didn't do this presentation on my own. A lot of contributors came into it and I, and I couldn't have done this work without my students, without the autistic students, without their parents and everything else. So you'll meet a lot of these people as we go along the way. So this is my family and even though I don't personally have autism, my father has high functioning autism and my little brother has high functioning autism. So I've lived with autism all my life. And then just to talk about myself, you might not know this, but when I was three, I had type C meningitis and I had 27 fits and I had brain damage and basically the th th three years of my life were erased. Doctors said there was no cure for it at the time and they literally said Spider-Man saved my life but that's a story for another time. I then later on was dis diagnosed with dyspraxia and this meant that I wasn't picked first for any sporting event, couldn't catch a ball, I couldn't ride a bike, I had very few friends and, and wasn't very confident in social situations and in the first year of comprehensive I was bullied and basically reserved myself to a chess club just because I didn't want to go outside because I was so scared. Then when I was 12 years old my mother thought it would be good for me to get my coordination right so she signed me up for music and I played drums and guitar in bands for many many years and I started TSD with my brother in 1995. I'd just like to introduce you now to my dad. That's me and my dad in the 80s. This is my dad now. Hello. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and he has, he has high-function autism, but he came from a time where it wasn't really diagnosed. Could get into a whole lecture about my dad, but just here are some pictures my mum took of his house. The house has about 20 rooms. Every single room is filled with multiple... If you can see here, he's got the same game twice. He just hoards everything. But he's so intelligent, just got by. He was known back then in the 60s as just being very, very intelligent. My brother I really want to talk about. Here's me and my brother in the 90s. This is my brother now. Hello! Basically, my brother had to pull out of school because his autism was so bad. He also had a skeletal condition. He couldn't be around the sun. He'd get migraines. And so I brought him through with music. There's me, my dad, and my brother playing in a band. And as you can see, my brother's wearing his red glasses. He's not very well dressed. He wasn't very outgoing. And my relationship with my brother is basically how I form my relationship with autistic people. The school didn't know what to do with him. In Tangstro, he couldn't carry on because his condition was so bad. He was kicked out of the gymnastics because they... But I would force my brother to do things. So here is a very quick look at all the bands that me and my brother played over the years. As you can see, there's a gradual change in him. He's more confident, he's dressing better. Now he has a job, he has a girlfriend, he has a house. He has all these things, and it's because I made him do a lot of things that he didn't want to do and he hated for me at the time, but I know he's thankful now. And I'd just like to show you very quickly a bit of my brother playing in a band with him. This song's actually called Brother. And we've been in many bands over the years, but basically, my relationship with my brother is how I, I, I work the... Yeah, that's enough of that. So there you can see, you can see, you can see, you can see the transformation. It is him at 15. This is a TSD party we had in 2016. There's a little bit of a reunion, but he's like a completely different person. A lot of people thought he was another brother that I had, not the same brother, but he changed in every single way because, through music, basically. So I'd just like to talk about my day job now. This is me and my day job that I did. And I worked in the college for 12 years and I, I love being around music and I loved helping people with music. Obviously, you teach there for a number of years, you're going to get students with autism. I'd like to just give you two examples of how by the time they got to us at 16, 17 in the college, the education system had already failed these students. Mystery student A over here, he had about 12 key skills, no GCSEs, and I was like, how does that work? And what basically happened in the education system was that he couldn't do the GCSEs, so they just chucked him into key skills. He couldn't even write his name but they gave him qualifications and after he worked for us he did get a level two qualification and he earned it another lad over here was one of the best guitarists i'd ever met in my life he could also sing he could also play the harmonica very gifted musician he passed the level two course in another college and because he was awkward they wouldn't let him onto the level three he came with us he got his qualification and now he's a very successful session musician so basically my experience in work was that these people were being failed 
before they got to us was my experience. So I'd just like to talk about my TSD class now. And in 2010, when I started teaching, I didn't really want to be a teacher. I was forced into it and I was running a class and I was like, yeah, I'll do this once a week, but I, I really wanted to train. I only had teenagers and adults and I, I really never thought kids would ever want to learn from me. I thought I'd, I wouldn't be the sort of class for them. So it was very limited. Like much of you, when you start off, you do it one class a week and everyone's learning together. So I just thought it'd be good to talk about my teaching approach. Your approach is probably very similar, that I don't look at someone's age. If, if they have a brown belt, whether they're seven or 70, they are a brown belt. They have the same responsibility, same everything. My main thing is I, I like to build confidence in students. And as I build that confidence, I add adversity and I try and push people, but also celebrate their success. And I'm sure all of you are the same. I think this will be very important as I, as I go forward. So then in 2017, I, I got my own dojan. At the time, I only had 40 students. So I was probably well in over my head. But one of the things that I wanted to do was split the class, have white belts, orange belts in one class, teach them the basics. And then when they got the green green belt, really start pushing them in what I call real tang shiro. Like So they got the basics. You don't have to show them a push-up. You don't have to show them a front snap kick. We can just start working with the principles and fundamentals. So we were getting more families, more children. Children, but I was still sort of turning around and going, yeah, this, you, 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 you're too young for this class. You don't know you're right from left. You're not listening. And at the time, Master Morgan had a Tiny Tigers class. And my little line was, ah, go train with Master Morgan until you're old enough. And then I'll kick you on the head. I would be sending students away, basically, that didn't fit my mold of teaching because I just thought they were, they were slowing down my class. And, and, and this wasn't right. I'd just like to take this opportunity for you to meet my friend, Mr. Killsby. Some of you might know Mr. Killsby is no longer training because of a hip injury. But he still comes stretching with me once a week. We would travel up and down to Cambridge, have lots of long conversations about tanks and other things. And Mr. Killsby had a very, very good theory about what we all had in common. Why, why do we all train together? Why do we all train for 17, 20 years, 47 years? So this is him giving his... Okay, Gus, somewhat nervously, I'm going to repeat what I said to you years ago. All the people that do the martial arts, in my view, are suffering OCD to a greater or lesser extent. Repetition, repetition, we call it focus, it's OCD. You know all about that, don't you? <laughs> so, so Miss Kills, we said we're all obsessive, we're all compulsive, we've got something that we like to do, we like to you know, tie our dough bark in a certain way, we like a certain combination. So we, we've got these traits, all of us in it. So now I'd like you to meet Tom. This was Tom when I first met him. This is Tom now. Hello. Tom came to my class and I just had that look about him. He's gonna need someone with him. So I put one of my seniors with him and then before I know it, he's running around the class. He's making noises like a penguin. He's, he's stimming, uh, which I didn't know that word, but it's basically un, you know, flapping and, oh my God, I, I can't teach this kid. And I was about to do my line. Oh, I'll send you to Master Morgan's Tiny Tiger. Oh, he's eight. Oh, he can't go. And then I was like talking to mum. I was going, well, I do do private sessions, but I, I really do the privates for adults. I don't think kids would be interested in it. And you just, you just saw this look on the mum's face. She was just like, I've taken him everywhere. I, I can't. So I just started working with Tom. I remember a very awkward conversation I had with her when I said, oh, you know, Tom's autism is, is really quite severe. And she's like, Tom's not autistic. And I was just like looking at her going, oh no, I've, I've really messed up now. And I just felt terrible. But uh, again, what I want to show you now is my journey. Uh, luckily I filmed the sessions with Tom because often his grandparents would bring him and I'd want to show his parents the progress. So I didn't do it on purpose. It's just, I was doing this between work and class and trying to fit in these sessions. So I was totally learning as I went along. This is a little video, I hope it's self-explanatory. And again, if you have questions, please ask later. But here's a little video of how I met Tom. In the bottom corner is the sort of progression of sessions. Say, yeah, yeah, do your blocks. Say barrel. Barrel. Good morning. Barrel. Guys up. High block. Low block. Okay, two punches. Snap kick. Way! <laughs> jump. Now you go jump. One off the floor. Just jump. Come on. That's better. Now ready. One, two, good. Two low blocks, ready. One, two. Two into low blocks, ready. One, two. Sit. Okay, man. Hook. Okay. Oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. It's okay. me. Good. Okay, number four. Boom. Good. For one. There's a wrist grab. Come on, buddy. Let's go. No. Back away. Number three. Okay. Number four. Okay. Okay. Left. Right. Punch. Block. Set. 
Change, change, change. Left. Good. Right. That hand. That's it. Good. Go. Good. Next. This one. So this is brand new for this week. These are Tom's hand techniques, okay? So we've only been through them once. He's gonna show you how they're done. So we've learned the first three today. He's gonna to practice them. And then we're gonna do four or five next week. Come on, Tom. Come here, five minutes. Ready? Yeah, chimpy. Okay, number one. Ready? Okay, number two. Good, number three. Oh, so Tom's won two tags for knowing those two. So let's see if he passes the, the hand technique. Now he's like, block, punch. Number five, wave and punch. Boom, he did it! You're gonna get a new tag, buddy. Let me get a tag from the thing. Well done. Check. Yeah, you get to look at it. You did pretty well. Okay, come on, three, one times punch. Ready, come on. Two, set. So, as you can see there, what I learned from Tom. So, so it's, it's a definite learning experience, and Tom did a private grading with Master Morgan. I remember she saying that she was very impressed with him. Tom doesn't stim anymore, he doesn't make noise anymore. He's very good at communication. He often leads the class, and since he got his orange belt, he's joined in with the main class. So that was a great success, but again, I just thought it was one student. And what I want to talk about is how what I did with him as you can see the standing still the the chumbi the Korean those were things that would make him switch off when I use props when I use little games to get him engaged I would still get the same learning out of him and but he, he would get rewarded for it it was this thing I call the feedback loop I was just trying to create a more effective feedback loop for Tom's specific needs and then once he got engaged when I started giving him these bits, bits of plastic and he started going, I want this bit of plastic. It was like, right now, Tom, you've got to stay still. And it would eventually, he'd get into what I call the traditional Tang Shiro class. And now he loves it. He gets, he's just learned Pyong Samdan. And every time you say, Tom, you're doing Pyong Samdan, he gets so excited. He loves training now. He loves leading the class. He loves watching the videos. It's, it's just a complete turnaround. So then I left my job because I, just, I was just like, I can't do my job and this, is, I, can't, I can't do both. And as I say, the education system was failing people because these students were coming to me and I couldn't get to them. I felt like I couldn't be a good music teacher, but I could be a good Tang Shiro teacher. So I left my job. We set up the Tiny Tigers and I was very nervous about setting this up because I didn't know anything about teaching Tiny Tigers, but I knew about teaching Tom and I took all those skills that I'd learned with Tom and I put them into the Tiny Tiger class and it was a learning curve like everything, how to do it as a group, but a lot of the skills that I learned from the Tiny Tigers would later go on to help me in the future. I just wanted to mention quickly here that we also at this time started running an adult beginner course. I don't know if you had this in your club, but sometimes adults come in and go, I'm too old, I'm overweight. And what they don't like doing is they don't like being next to a 12 year old who can do jump kicks in the forms and then to look silly. So we just took them through a four week course, taught them three punches, three kicks, three blocks. And in this time I wouldn't do any Korean, wouldn't do any of the traditional stuff until they'd learnt these skills. And then I did a mini lesson with them. And at the end of the four weeks, we give them a dough box. They already had people in the class they knew. And they came into the class and now 50% of these students are now green and brown belts with us. Two years later, obviously some have left because of COVID and other reasons. So now I'd like you to meet Daniel. This was him when I met him. Uh, this is him now. Hello. And basically, Master Morgan knew about Tom. Daniel first started training with Master Morgan. He couldn't handle it in the class. So then she rang me up and I just thought it was better for Master Morgan when to talk about this. When I met Daniel, he really struggled to learn in a normal classroom environment. He found really overwhelming and quite stressful. He really struggled with, with the loud noises and he, he would get to a point where he'd be running around the room covering his ears and really, really quite overwhelmed. Progressing from the one to ones, Daniel has been given the opportunity to work on his Tang Sudo skills in a tailored environment for his needs and this has really enabled Daniel to flourish and witnessing Daniel going from, from that first session where he, he really couldn't work in that environment to then seeing him complete his first grade in. The transformation was amazing. 
Danny was really focused. He, you know, he, you, you wouldn't be able to tell that he had any kind of issues because he did such a great job. Continue to work with Mr. Rogers in this way, then allow Daniel to slowly progress to re enable him back into the classroom environment. And so much so that Daniel recently completed his first live testing, where actually he was the loudest person in the room. And it was, it was really a great thing to see and really proud of the progress he's made. Looking forward to see where he goes on his journey. So basically, Tom's conditions were his conditions. I found out what he had trouble with. He had trouble staying still and he had trouble with communication. Daniel's problem was that loud noises made him shut down and he was also very, very sensitive to touch and being touched. So I had to change my approach slightly with him, but I used the same methods with Tom, now with Daniel. Now with Tom, I tried to show you from white belt to orange belt. I'm going to show you Daniel's journey up to now, including all the breaks with COVID because I know they've affected all our students. So uh, here we go. And just hit you, okay? So as soon as we punch, we bring it straight back. Go for it. Do number four. Now number five. Perfect. Good. Number two. Yes. Okay, try that again. Welcome to this week's Chumbi Wong Dong. In this week's episode, I have my friend Daniel here helping me out, okay? And he's going to help make push ups and sit ups and papaki really fun because Daniel, you don't like it when it's boring, do you? Can do it, guys. Up, buddy. Let's, let's do some martial arts. Play with Robin later, yeah? Mm -hmm. Leanna, so as soon as you finish number one, straight into number two, okay? okay. Let's go a little bit faster. Okay. Come on, Dan, you can do it. Let's go. Guys, up. Ha! Okay. Yes, number two. Block, step in, elbow, spin. That's it, number three. Block and chop. Good, number four. Fist punch. And number five, five punches. Oh, well, that was good, Dan. Ready. Punch. Are you ready? Good. Sit down. What? Go. Oh, next one. <laughs> no way. Step <laughs> back ever so gently. Don't knock it out of town. Just gently address it and then put it back up. Then from here, punch, kick, back step, punch and kick, back step, three. One more time, baby. No, sir. 
Schieber. So again, lots going on there, but basically the one thing I want to talk about, so much I could talk about there, but the one thing I talk about is in January, Daniel's mother, Kirsty, got in touch with me and said he's reverted, he's worse than ever, he's gone back to everything, he'd reverted back to everything. I said, look, I can't do anything. I said, maybe you can get him a doctor's note. Next day she got him a doctor's note, and for a time Daniel was my only student. And he, as soon as he came back, he was back to his normal self. It was a crazy transformation from not training to training. Uh, and then over this time, I had word of mouth. People started to leave reviews. Riley and Jess and Elliot, and as you can see there, they've all gone on to have a lot of success. And the, the methods were starting to work on, on more and more students. I just want to quickly show you here like another activity. I think ma actually Master Harvey sent me this for my Tiny Tigers. But I'm just going to talk through this now as he goes through. So we put these rings down. They're coloured red for low block, blue for punch, yellow for kick. And he just goes through, and Riley, my student here, would call it a maze. He'd go, look at the picture, and I'd say, turn towards the picture so you can stay in. So I gradually, each time he completes it, I take away one of the rings. So I take away the punch ring first, so it's not there for him. And then I take away the yellows. And, and then finally, you'll see on here, the, the red. And every time he goes through, he's getting more confident with his footwork. This didn't happen over one session. It took many, many times. but. Mm -hmm. He's figuring it out for himself, again, from this feedback loop. Just to quickly mention adult students, Sophie joined with us straight away. Alicia did one private, and then I was like, look, she can do everything, she can join a class. She sometimes, they, they both sometimes find it overwhelming, but they do well. Luke here is a student who started very recently with me, and I didn't feel comfortable taking a picture of him, but he, he prefers the one-to-one -one sessions. But we do have adult students as well, but in my own experience, they haven't had the same issues as, as the children. I just thought I'd take this opportunity to introduce you to Richie. Richie now. Hello. And Richie, you know, as, as you do, people start to train with you. you. You don't really know them that well. And then when I left my job, he was like, well, I, I run this care home and I work with people with many issues. Maybe you can come and help them. So Richie was instrumental me, with me connecting with more people, different kinds of additional needs. But also he kept connected me with the, the stakeholders group. So in March, just before the lockdown, we did our first presentation with the stakeholders. It went very well. Everyone was like, oh, I can't wait for you to do this program and everyone got locked down and then in November we had a similar meeting with the police again they said we can't wait for you to help out more people got locked down and then this lockdown some children here I, I went out and helped with and even though I had only one 45 minute session with them all these children in this picture engaged with it in just one session from these methods I came so I was starting to test it on brand new people not just people in my gym but it worked with people I'd never met before and I'd have very limited experience with. So this brought us to the additional needs class where we just, you know, because of rhyming ASD, TSD, we just needed a name for it. And we, and because of our links with the stakeholders, they just put it in all their groups, Sparkle with the NHS, a couple of other things. And we had six students almost uptake immediately, which was the number we wanted. So here's the ASD class that we launched. Again, it's six members, but because of summer holidays and it being on a Saturday, we don't always have six and we have lots of helpers. I'm just gonna show you a little video now of this was the real test. It's like, could they work on their own, but could they work as a group? So you're gonna see a video now where they're all working together. I've got a lot of helpers. All these helpers work in some sort of medical industry and they're nurses and Richie and, and everyone. But having this just extra one-to-one -one person to help them when they when they need assistance has been really instrumental. Brilliant hooks. Run back. Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh, Mali, you didn't concentrate. That's it, good man. Oh, okay. 
Hey. Oh, that's a good side kick. So, for example, Tyler and Regan, a little bit older, we think in another couple of weeks they'll be able to join a regular class. The main thing is that I've been talking a lot about what I see in the Dojang, but I only see them for an hour, you know, maybe two hours a week. The real story is just some reviews from the parents about what th they think of the change in their children. But also, I thought it was very important to show you what they've, they've been like in the home life. So this is Daniel's mother, Kirsty, talking about what Daniel's been like outside since training. Daniel has been training for about two years now and outside the dojang he has overcome so much to the point now where he doesn't want to play on his own he will join in with small groups he will play with his cousins um which the first time in years because he's always wanted to be on his own on the outside whereas a few weeks back he um, wanted to play with them and it was so lovely he joined in they were chasing each other they were tackling each other they were laughing and giggling and it was really nice to see him joining in and not just being on his own daniel attends the hub through covid which was run by the play service and they've had him there for many years through the school holidays and again he's had one-to-one -one support and has always been on his own not wanting to join in with any of the activities that they had had planned but this summer holidays I have had messages back from the staff at the play scheme saying that Daniel has joined in with some smaller activities he's done some arts and crafts and He's played dodgeball and tennis um, with a group, a small group of other children. And they said how much he has improved and he can cope with. But basically just lots of stories about the children seeing noticeable differences straight away. I just wanted to mention this quickly about the parents joining. So out of the, the, the five students I have, parents have joined. Now I know it's not uncommon in class that they join class, your families go together, but I just feel that if your child has autism or some sort of additional need, it must be even harder to connect with them. And a lot of the mums especially, they had low confidence and they had anxieties and I'm sure the children fed off that. So then being more confident will help out. Hi, uh, my name is Joanne Oates and my son Elliot has joined Tang Sudo uh, with Savannah. His behaviour has changed enormously since he started training with Tang Sudo. He's got a diagnosis of ADHD, but we are on route to an ASD diagnosis also. Since training with Gus, his behaviour, both in Tang Sudo sessions in school and at home, has improved. We have had a number of breaks for various reasons, including the pandemic. The difference in his behaviour when we've had those breaks has been quite noticeable. And the improvements when he returns are always very, very clear. I cannot recommend taking up Tang Sudo enough. It helps enormously with every aspect of their life. As you can see there, my mums and their sons bonding over the Tang Sudo. I always remember a session where Tom was teaching his mum how to do a pad drill and I was like, that's incredible. Kirsty was very kind enough to, to go into real detail about why she joined. The reason I joined, I saw how Tang Sudo helped Daniel overcome so much. Daniel joined in the August and I was like, no, I can't do this. I was asked by Master Morgan if I ever thought I would like to join with him and I said no, never, purely because I thought I was too old. Starting from scratch, my fitness was non-existent, low confidence, suffered with anxiety in new situations, so Tang Sudo was about as far from my comfort zone as I could get. But seeing Daniel improve and overcome, I started to think maybe I could do it. Maybe it could help me. So in the November, Sabnam Rogers ran a beginner's class. So 
it was four weeks so I signed up and thought see how it goes and after the beginners class I joined and it was the best thing that I did it helps my anxiety my fitness has improved massively it's like an extended family everybody's so supportive so helpful nobody looked down on you as like you can't do it you're not as fit it was just so supportive and helpful and I'm really glad that I gave it a go and took the chance. This is the, the bit of the presentation that's most useful to you. If you wanted to bring autistic students to your club, how would you go about it? So we're going to talk about the initial assessment. You can do your own initial assessment, but I'll, I'm going to quickly run through the video. Now it's a six step process. Just before we start, I just want to talk to you to meet Alfie. I've only had Alfie very recently, but he has been my most difficult student. For a start, when he came to me, he was three. So that's Alfie in August, and this is him saying hello. Can you say hello? Hello. There we go. Now, the assessment did not work with Alfie at all, but as you, but he is in the video, so I want you to introduce you because you're going to see him a lot in the video. This isn't after one session, this is after three months. But then I asked his mum to say something because he, he, she said that after our last session, he said, he's going to get a haircut now. He's never had a haircut from anyone before. This is huge. And I said, can you put this in a video? And she went, yes, okay. And then she sent me this video and it's so good, I, I couldn't leave it out. Alfie started Tang Sudo with Angus back in May this year. Alfie was three at the time. He, not long after that, turned four. I has been diagnosed with autism back in July 2020 when he just turned three years old. Before uh, Tang Sudo, there was a lot of behavioural difficulty in the sense that because he can communicate as well, he would get very angry and frustrated and have meltdowns and hit out and was quite aggressive, which didn't help that he couldn't communicate anything either because that made things worse. He also wouldn't allow you to show him how to do things, help him with anything. He wouldn't step foot into the nursery classroom. He would only go in the hall on his own with his one-to-one -one or the playground with his one-to-one. -one. And he did this from... Uh, October last year up until June this year. Ever since he's started Tang Sudo with Angus back in May, he normally goes to a weekly session for half an hour. His language has come on a lot more. He can now put sentences together, communicate things with me. And so the hitting and the head butting and the screaming, that's gradually coming to a stop. He now has dry nappies in the night. He's now spending going to bed on his own, which he wouldn't do before. The last three weeks of term every day, he went to into the nursery by, by himself with all the other kids and he was fantastic. No meltdown, no upsets. So that was fantastic. He now communicates to me better at home as well. Overall, ever since June, I've seen massive improvements with Alfie, not only with his language, his communication, everything in regards to his behavior has improved massively. And I feel like our relationship has improved with that as well, as well as Alfie's relationship with everybody else around him too. He now listens to Angus, follows instructions really well and couldn't be more proud of the progress that he's made over the last couple of months and fingers crossed that will only continue to get better as time goes on. So I'm just going to talk through this video here. So I get them in straight away, find out their name, their age and then I get them jumping over something. So this gets the, the, the kids into it straight away. <laughs> There's Alfie. He wouldn't jump over before. This is Elliot jumping over. But they just go really, really high and you just get some running around, get some active. I usually do about two rounds. The first one is height, then I go for distance. Once they hit the noodle, they move on to the next, you know, basically that's, that's it. They've just got them in. They're hooked, they're having fun. Yeah, they, they just feel so good about jumping over. It's like they've never done it before. And then look, you say, you know, you've jumped one Daniel, you would say. And then uh, we might do some self-defense, a tactile episode, uh, exercise where I just get them to hit things. Here's Alfie hitting things. Elbow, I tell them to brush their teeth. Wow, that was a good one, Alfie. And this is Alfie in his last session. And he did so well. If they're a little bit older, I'll do some stretching with them instead. Just sat down, a little bit of butterfly, a little bit of taking one leg out, a little bit of straddle, uh, just to relax them, bring them down. And then we go on to the, 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 the kicking part. It's 
So it's just 10 kicks with the leg. Simply show it to him. So he loses balance. And now already by the end, his balance is better. Show them the side of the foot that they're kicking with. This is the feeling you want to make. And then we take them to the wall, teach them about balance, say, look, you can do this at home. Just lift your leg up, do a couple of stretches. Walk around them so they're always looking at you. They can see you. Uh, I didn't have footage of this, so my tiny tigers helped me out with this bit. But it just shows you you can do it in all your classes. You know. And then we do a little punching. I just keep teaching like jab and cross out of standing the stance. But again, hitting something, putting gloves on them so they're nice and safe. And then you just turn into a little game. You say, look, I'm gonna hold up my left pad. You punch with your left hand. I'm gonna hold up my right pad. You punch with your right hand. If they can do that, then you get under cover, which you'll see now. And it's just a little game where they have to work it out for themselves. And if they do it well, you can move about with them, give them things like jab, cross, double jab, real simple punches. But it just finishes on a game where they feel like they've engaged and learned something and you basically take them through the tent. And then you have a chat with the parents and see what they want to go forward. They might want to do more one-to-one -one sessions, they might want to join the class. Steps to joining a class. Now this is where it becomes difficult. Every student is different, but it's all about that feedback loop. It's all about making them feel good about themselves, making them feel like they've achieved something. Don't put them in the corner. We've had so many parents who said, like he tried rugby, he was put on the side. You make them feel like they're a superstar. That has been my thing. And once they feel like a superstar, they want to do it. And once they want to do it, you can teach them routines. My, my real feeling is if they, if they know the eight basic kicks, if they know the four basic blocks, if they know what a front stance is, you know, if you can get them with their one steps, and especially that first form, once they've got those skills, they know enough about Tang Sudo that they can join a class, that the, the new routine will not be difficult for them. But again, this is gonna be different with everyone, and, and you'll make your own judgment as the instructors you are. But this has been my success so far, and this is the end result. This is what the desired results. As you know, I put out a lot of videos. There was a combo that Daniel actually made up, so we called it the Daniel, and this is Daniel and Tom in a very busy class, not only doing the technique in front of the camera, in front of the students, but actually leading the class. Is coming up correctly, and the front leg roundhouse can really help with that. And then when you've got that, a really good line work drill is front leg roundhouse, back leg roundhouse, and what you're trying to do is turn on your foot and in front of your partner and lift your arms up. You can just touch the dough box and then if you're flexible, uh, kick towards it. All the other white belt and orange belt students look up to these boys now, which is, which is amazing. So just to mention quickly that I am working with other students. Daniel over here has Down syndrome. He just did his first grader. And I literally met this lad, Ollie, with cerebral palsy down half his body. So obviously the, that assessment that I showed you earlier didn't work for him, obviously. So we've tailored it. But his parents have already said that he's getting stronger every class. And he just loves the training. And, you know, he, 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 he does hour sessions. And he, he, he can hold plank. He can do all the kicks already. And this is something, again, that I've never done. In conclusion, all, all I want to say is these are just a selection of some of the students I've helped so far. I want to keep helping more students. But one of the things they told me in the stakeholders meeting was, how are you going to franchise this? You're just one person. And when I was given the opportunity to give this class, I was saying, well, I know a lot of instructors. And if you guys can help more students, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, Mas Khan was down in Wales the other day. He says, you know, in, in the UK we've touched, what was it, 750,000 hearts so far. If we, if we can help out more people, you know, the, the parents that come to me, they are just so thankful. They're like, we, we, we struggle. You know, uh, Alfie's mum said, this is the first holiday that 
you know, we've actually been able to communicate. This is the first holiday we've been able to go somewhere. If you can do that for those students, then what we do is, is worth doing. So sorry if I've talked for a long time. If you do have any questions, it's fine, but I, I do appreciate it's late. Mm -hmm.